If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter 2. You know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke um, often record the same incidents. And, uh, you know, they'll have a little different angle, a little different, um, you know, one will point out details and another one did not. And, and actually, that's one of the proofs of the, uh, the reality that those men wrote those books. If every one of them verbatim said the same thing, um, in a court of law, that's a little bit suspect because it's not normal for, you know, three or four or five or 10 people to see the same incident and tell all the same details. Matthew, Mark and Luke. Now, John was a little different. John, uh, John seemed to reveal a whole different side of the Lord. And there's parables, there's events, there's things that are in the book of John that are not in Matthew, Mark and Luke. Um, but though Matthew, Mark and Luke often tell the same incidents. It's not true of the birth of Christ because Mark does not even mention the birth of Christ. That story is only found in Matthew and in Luke. And that's interesting because Matthew presents Jesus Christ. Each one of the Gospels present Jesus in a different light. Matthew presents Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. But Luke presents Jesus Christ as the son of man, you know, Luke was a medical doctor. He was the beloved physician and he takes Jesus Christ and portrays him as God come in the flesh. And so he highlights a lot of things about Jesus Christ, about his human side. And so let's read the very familiar story there. Luke chapter two. I want to talk to you this morning about folks that showed up at Jesus birth, but folks that were looking for Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things about the story, um, as you know, but but one of the things about the Christmas story is you have all these different people and they were looking for Jesus Christ. Luke 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he, Joseph, was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. It would be a sign. It was something very unusual that a king, but especially the one sent from God, would be born of all places in a manger, in a feeding trough, uh, a place none of you ladies would stick your baby. And the angel said, you'll know he's the one. And here's how you'll know. There were other babies probably in Bethlehem that night, but they wouldn't have any trouble figuring out who this one was. Verse 13. And suddenly 
There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this chance to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and giving us a place to meet, Lord, and just that you designed this whole thing. Lord, we thank you for this time of the year, and we thank you, Lord, that you came. And, Lord, I pray, we pray that you'd help us now in these next few minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. He says there in verse 12, the angel says, This shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. And, uh, you know, after that little brief vision of angels was over in verse 15, they said, let us go now. Let us go now. Verse 16, it says they came with haste. Man, they found that baby in. And, uh, you know, the, the next, it, it just seems like there's always this natural progression. Uh, and you see it in a picture form here. But anytime somebody finally sees the Lord, and I don't mean with their eyes, but I mean with their heart, they, they finally get it. They see it. The lights come on. They understand the significance of Jesus Christ. He's not just a historical figure. He's someone that God sent for them. And when they find him, boy, it's almost, almost without fail. The next thing somebody wants to do is let us make known abroad the saying. They, uh, they want to tell somebody. And everybody that heard, they wondered. The shepherds received an immediate announcement. In other words, the angel said, you know, uh, the babe is very nearby and um, you'll find him and you'll find him tonight. You'll find him in the next couple hours. Go find him. And the shepherds would hear the angel of the Lord. Um, you know, for the wise men in Herod, they did not get an immediate announcement. Um, but the shepherds did. You know, the all these other folks out in the hillside, they didn't get that immediate announcement. They didn't have that vision. They didn't see the angel. They didn't hear the heavenly host. Um, but the shepherds would go out and tell everybody in that area. <coughs> and others would have to accept the witness of the shepherds. And that is always the way it is. Um, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. And he said to Nicodemus and alluding to him and all his religious crew, he says, he says, we're, we're telling you what we've seen, but you receive not our witness. And the next verse, he says, if I have told you of earthly things and you don't receive it, how are you going to believe if I tell you of heavenly things? In first John John the Apostle said, that which was from the beginning, which we, John's talking about him and the other 11. He said, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. You know, uh, none of us have seen the Lord uh, with our eyes. Um, but you know what we are riding on? We're riding on the witness of the men that did. In 2 Peter 1, uh, Peter talks about his experience with James and John on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw Jesus Christ glorified and they saw Moses and Elijah. And Peter says, and this voice we heard. 
not even the uh, the rest of the 11 heard it. Uh, there were uh, that would have left uh, nine others. He said the other nine didn't even hear it. But he said, and this voice we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. In Ephesians 2, it says our faith is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. The apostles and the prophets, you know what they did? They told and they wrote what they saw and what they heard. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And our job, we believe their witness. And our job is to believe and act upon it. You know, the shepherds believe the announcement of the angel and they come looking for Jesus. But you need to picture the story um, they don't know which house. They don't know which stable. There would have been a bunch. So can you see the shepherds? We don't know how many there were. But man, they uh, they hit Bethlehem and they start walking around and they're going to every place that looks like it's got some animals, which you remember in that day. It's not like our day. You know, I, I don't know. There There's a few of you that have critters parked in your backyard, but most of us do not. You know, uh, back in that day, that was their livelihood. You know, they didn't have the fridge and the freezer. They had the critters in the yard. Okay. And um, so everybody had them. And they're going from door to door. And can you imagine, a, you know, a knock on the door? And, hey, 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 um, uh, you, you, don't have a, you don't have to have a young couple and a baby in your, in your, in your uh, stable, do you? And they're going, hello? Do we ever put babies in our stable? <laughs> And they're going from door to door, but they don't care how stupid it looks. And you'll almost always find the Lord when you reach the point where you don't care how stupid you look. Oh, when you humble yourself, you'll find him. The reason some people can't find him, they can't get low enough. And they're going from door to door. And they found him. And they found him. They're simple Faith caused action, and it always does. People talk about faith. They talk about faith. And, you know, our religious world, Baptist, we know the Baptist the best. You know, we, we make a big deal about faith. But there's always one infallible indicator about real faith. It gets you off the couch. Every time oh well that's interesting <laughs> wonder what google has to say about that oh pastor yes yes we it's it's weird we believe in walking by faith well there's one way to really know does it move you did you do anything this week because you believe this Going to the fridge is not an act of faith. Going to the store is not an act of faith. Going to Walmart and Toys R Us is not an act of faith. But you know what I'm talking about. There are some things that you will only do. You will only do if you believe this. And a simple act of faith. Do you have faith? Well, you know, the right answer is, well, of course. Well, you know, that there's a, the real easy way to know is, does it move you towards Jesus Christ? Does it cause any action? And simple faith caused haste. They believed it and they moved with haste. Well, I want you to see another person that was looking for the Lord. And that's also in the same chapter, Luke chapter 2. And look at verse 21. This is eight days later. Luke 2. Boy, that the, the birth of our Lord was filled with action. And it was filled with people that were looking for Jesus. Luke 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, 
as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That offering tells you something. Okay, that was the lowest, most affordable offering, and it was what the poor brought. You know, most of the offerings of this nature, you 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 brought a lamb, you know, and uh, and and the, the Lord sort of had an order there in in the book of Leviticus. Um, you know, if you were, most people bring a lamb, or they would bring this. But if and it says, and if that be too much for thee, God said you could bring. Turtle doves or two young pigeons. That was for the poor. That tells you something about Mary and Joseph here. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. You remember they'd been waiting a long time, hundreds and hundreds of years. They knew the Redeemer was coming. But the Holy Ghost one day spoke to Simeon and said, Simeon, you're going to be one of the ones you're actually going to see it happen. Verse 27. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, the light to light the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. He was waiting, verse 25 says, for the consolation of Israel. And it was revealed that he would see Christ. And here's Simeon. You know what he's doing? He is not a young man here. And you know that from verse 29. Um, uh, verse 29, he's, he's it, it sounds like he had reached a point where he was ready to go, ready to die. Not, not out of, but just old age. And he was weary. But he was excited because he knew he would see what all the generations before him had not seen. And it was promised that he would live. He would not breathe his last breath till he saw it. So, you know, he's coming into the temple and he's looking and he's walking down the street and he's looking. It wasn't told him that he would find him in the temple. He didn't know where he would come across the baby. You know what he's doing? He's looking. You know, David said, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And Simeon, he is looking. Every day he's looking. And in verse 27, the Spirit said, Simeon, he's here. Simeon was looking actively, aggressively for him. And he found him. But there's another person in this passage that was also looking. Look at verse 36. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Acer. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years. Let me explain that for a moment. She was of a great age. So the first Lord tells you, you know, she was she was way up in years. OK, she had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. So the first thing the Lord tells you is. When she was a young woman, she had married somebody and uh, she'd been married seven years. And, uh, you know, we're, we're assuming that he passed away. OK, she'd only been married to him for seven years. And she was a widow of four score and four years. So she had been. Young, you know, maybe she got married at 17 or 18 and um, she's married seven years and her husband dies. And now 84 more years. Boy, this, this lady, she's wow. She is up there. She is not young. 
Uh, it's interesting, both Simeon and Anna. You know, some people get this idea, and the devil wants to plant it in, in people's heads, that Christianity is really for the young people, you know. And, and it is. Remember, now thy creator in the days of thy youth. <clears throat> if you'll remember him in the days of your youth, You'll, you'll avoid a lot of scars and a lot of heartache and a lot of baggage and a lot of things you can't undo. But, you know, uh, Christianity is for everybody, everywhere, at every age. You know, uh, Moses gets called into the ministry at 80. 80. You know, there's people that get 50 or 60 and they go, oh, well, you know, I, I guess, you know, I can, I can pray and, you know, throw a little money in the pot. But I, but I guess, I guess really I'm done. We just need to let the younger people take it. Well, you know what? Uh, that's not how the Lord sees it. I remember going to a Bible school when I was, went right out of high school. I was 18 and, and um, it was a big church. They ran about 1300 on Sunday morning. That church in its heyday had ran about 2000. The auditorium, they built for that. The auditorium, the big balcony. It was uh, two or three times the size of this auditorium. Many of you have seen that over the other night. Um, the, that auditorium would seat 2,500 people. And um, they, they, they ran a whole bunch of buses, like I want to say eight or 10 or 12 buses, big school buses, not the little mini buses, full-blown school buses. And in those days, in those days, it was very common for the independent Baptist churches. In those days, we're talking the 70s and 80s, the mega churches were the independent Baptist churches. And man, they were growing like wildfire. And a lot of them had big bus ministries. And um, so I get there. I get there in um, the fall of 81. And um, if you were there as a student, you know, you had to get involved in some ministry. Now, they had things that we were required to do. But you also had to be in the bus ministry or teaching Sunday school or, you know, they had several things like that. And... Um, I came on the scene and all I knew was you had all these college students running the buses. Like, um, you know, they would be driving the buses. They would be, can you imagine that? They would be driving the buses. They would be every Saturday. If you had a bus route, if, if you know, if, if bus number 11 was your bus, you had the bus captain and he was usually the guy that drove the bus. And uh, you had four or five or six college students on the bus. And every Saturday you'd go out and you'd knock on the doors of all the kids that rode the buses and, uh, you know, you try to keep that thing going. And most of the kids that got bussed in were um, coming from the poor section. Um, you know, the parents were glad to have them out of the house for, the, for a few hours. And uh, but, man, we you know, you filled those buses up. They bring in hordes of kids and young people. And um, but there's a problem with that. The problem is, what do you do when the holidays come? You got all the college kids running the buses. Well, that's fine till these two or three weeks right now, everybody goes home. And then that's fine until summer comes when all the, when all the college students go home. It's like, man, also well, you got a panic going. And I was talking to somebody one day. I said, man, that just seems really weird. Why, why did they do it this way? And they said, well, really they didn't do it this way. They said, when they started those bus routes, it was all that they had older guys, you know, married couples, families in the church that were running those buses. I remember as a little kid going to a church. Mom and dad had just been saved a few years. And we were going to a, a large church in our area. And one day our, our, our car broke down. And uh, the church bus drove right by our house. And I remember, you know, it was a warm day. And, you know, my mom and my sister and I, we stood out and we caught the bus to church. And it was sort of a neat experience. You know, the guy that ran that bus? And the guy that had ran that bus for years and the guy that ran that bus years after we quit, they had four buses. The buses were called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> and uh, the guy that ran that bus, he looked ancient when I was a kid. Like he was a big strapping guy, it, you know, but he, he was probably only 65, which is really looking younger all the time. And, and he, he was probably only 65, but he looked and like this old white haired gentleman and he ran that bus. You, you know, you know what he was? He was faithful as clockwork. You didn't have to worry about the holidays. You Do you understand? God has a work for everybody at every age. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear. 
yes, there's some things that it really helps if you got a bunch of young people with with an you know an overflow of energy. But uh, that doesn't mean that you just sort of drop everything and say, okay, well, it's time to coast. No, 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 no. Here's two people, and they're coming in, and Anna is ancient. And the Bible says she practically lived in the house of God. She's serving God with fastings and prayers night and day. And God says, oh, Anna, do I have a surprise for you? The greatest surprise of John the Apostle's life came at 91 or 92 years old when he's languishing on a prison island. And God says, well, John, you sure have been faithful. I got a surprise for you. And he wrote the book that we love that tells us about a whole bunch of stuff that's coming. She's in the temple, and verse 38 says, and she coming in that instant. In other words, here's Simeon, and he's holding the baby, and Anna walks in, and she gets in on this conversation. She was looking, and note the end of verse 38. It says, she spake of him, the baby, to all them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. You know who she was? She was part of many that were looking. You know, everybody wasn't looking. But, she, but you know how it is. The people that love the Lord, they find each other. Just like rebels. Rebels always find each other. But the people that love the Lord, they find each other. And they, they're looking forward to the same things. And she had friends. And they all knew that a Redeemer was coming. And all of a sudden she's standing there and she sees it and she knew, I mean, the Holy Ghost is right in the middle of this. And she hears Simeon and Simeon's talking about the Lord's Christ and the consolation of Israel and God's salvation for all people and the light of the Gentiles and the glory of Israel. And she's standing there and she goes, I know who this is. She goes, this is the one we've been looking for. You know, it's interesting. The shepherds found him in the manger. But Simeon and Anna found him in the church house. Imagine that. I know some churches are not worth the powder it would take to blow them up. But at the same time, at the same time. Well, you know what the Lord loves? The Lord loves, he calls it his house. Boy, how many times have we come to church and we needed something? And guess, guess what we found? Amen. We found he was he was waiting there. We were looking! And he said, he came to the right place. Look at Matthew 2. Are you looking this morning? If you are, I got good news for you. Matthew 2, some more people looking. Matthew 2, verse 1. And when Jesus was, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. You know, I got a lot I want to say this morning, and I know we, we just have a few more minutes. And I, if you want to write down 1 Kings 3, and four, if you're writing stuff down, you ought to go and read about Solomon and how, you know, God gave him that wisdom. You know, God appeared to him one night in Gibeon. Solomon had made a very um, uh, huge sacrifice to the Lord. And the Lord appears to him that night, says, Solomon, what shall I give thee? You know, you know, uh, a lot of Hollywood stupidity is built on plots that they've robbed from the Bible. And, you know, what you see that, you know, you know the movie, you know, and. And the, the genie and the guy finds it in the bottle, you know, and, and he rubs the lamp and the genie pops out and says, you've got three wishes, <laughs> you know. And and you know, you know where they got that, don't you? They got that right here. God shows up one night to Solomon and says, Solomon, if I gave you one thing, what would I give you? And boy, it's, it's just like Solomon had been thinking about this. He was new to the kingdom. 
And he recognized his inadequacy. And that's a terrible feeling. And yet spiritually, it's a wonderful place to be. And he said to the Lord, he said, oh, Lord. He said, you have made me the king over this kingdom. Millions of people. My father was the man after your heart. And here I am. And and Lord, I can't feel my dad's shoes. He says in so many words, he said, Lord, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. He said, Lord, if you would give me an understanding heart so I could somehow know what I'm doing. And it says in the speech, please the Lord. And the Lord says, ah, this is amazing. He said, you didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for a long life. You didn't ask for the necks of your enemies. You know, that's what any king would have asked for. Most of us, you know, if you could have anything and not feel guilty and not feel carnal, you would ask for riches and long life, probably the top of the list. And the Lord said, you didn't ask for that. The Lord said, you know what I'm going to do for you? He said, I'm going to give you a wise heart like nobody before you and nobody after you will ever have. And he said, and I'm going to give you what you didn't ask for. I'm going to give you riches and long life and the necks of your enemies. God says, I'm going to give you all those. You know what it says as you read down through 1 Kings 3 and 4? God gives Solomon that wisdom. And then the Holy Ghost says, His wisdom exceeded the wisdom of the men of the East country. These wise men, hundreds and hundreds of years later, where are they from? They're from the East. You know what those Eastern men, those Eastern Orientals, they they were not world conquerors, okay? But they were known for their wisdom. And the Holy Ghost even named some of those men who we know nothing about. And he said, Solomon, he he said, Solomon's wisdom exceeded them. These men are from the east. And notice what they say in verse two. And you guys could quote it saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. Would you keep your place there and look at numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, numbers, the fourth book in your Bible. Look at numbers 24. Man, I wish we had time to talk about this this morning, but this is another topic all in itself. And um, this is Balaam. And this is um, this is way, way back there. And Balaam has been called upon to curse Israel. And it's interesting, uh, you know, every time Balaam tries to curse Israel, because he does try to get a, a spiritual revelation, it's a strange story, but Balaam did have a connection with the true God. And every time he goes to God to get permission to curse Israel, God says, no, 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 no. And it's interesting in light of all that's going on in the world, I'll just make this comment in passing, that over a thousand years time, four times, God says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And, and, you know, that still holds true to this day, irregardless of who you follow and what you And Balaam says, I'm going to tell you what's going to befall your people in the latter days, which tells you Israel's still present in the latter days. But in the midst of all that, in the midst of all that prophecy, Balaam says something way, way, way before the book of Matthew. Look in Numbers 24, verse 17. Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob. Notice it's a capital S. He says somewhere way down the road, and you would think, you'd think, you know, well, that's just figurative. But it's, you know, it's amazing how many of these things are, are there. It's not just figurative. And they said, we have seen his star in the east. In Revelation 22, as the Bible closes out, you don't have to turn there, but it says this, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And then Jesus says, as he closes out the scripture forever, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star, capital S. If these men from the east were from Babylon, they would have had the writings of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel because Nebuchadnezzar in his day, Daniel chapter 4, sent out a decree to the whole world that all the world would reverence the God of Daniel. 
And Daniel had spoken of a prince that would come and of a kingdom would come and that it would rotate around Jerusalem. That's in Daniel chapter 9. And here we are, hundreds and hundreds of years later, and these wise men look out one dark night and they see a star like no other. And one of them says, look at that. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And of course, these guys, you know, they're not Christians, but they're very mystical, very spiritual. And one of them goes, that's not normal. There's something about that. There's somebody's trying to tell us something. And the other guy goes, do you remember what Nebuchadnezzar wrote about a ruler that would come? And it would be in Jerusalem. And the guy says, if I don't miss my guess, Jerusalem is straight that way. And they look at each other and they say, this is it. He's over there. Let's go look for him. And it's a long journey. It's nearly two years for him, for them. That's why Herod kills all the babies two years old and under when, when, they, when they don't show up again. It took them almost two years. He inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And man, as soon as they saw it, they started moving that way. It was a long journey. And they are wise men. And they know in their hearts, though they don't understand the significance of it, they know this is one of the greatest events of all time and one of the greatest kings of all time. They knew that that star pointed to a ruler. And it was a long journey. There was a lot of obstacles. Can you imagine riding a camel through the wilderness across deserts and across mountain ranges and all that stuff? There was a lot of obstacles and trouble and time, but their goal was to see him and to worship him. And they said, man, we got to find this guy. And God honors their desire. Look at Matthew 2 verse 9. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. It was over the top. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 11, they fell down and worshiped him. You know, all the rest of their life, and I think this was true for every one of these folks we pointed out so far, every one of these folks would remember this as the greatest night of their life. You know, all the rest of their life, those wise men, I mean, if they could make a trip, you know, uh, two years time, they had a lot of money, they had ability, you know, and that, that, that time frame, and even up into the, what they call the dark ages, people never traveled. You know, you and me, we don't understand that. We just jump in a car. We go. We get a plane ticket. We, you know, uh, man, you can be around the world. But th there was a day when nobody traveled. These guys could travel and all the rest of their life, they'd look at each other and they go, you remember that trip? And you remember all the heartache? You remember all the work? And, and one of them would say, but was it ever worth the trip? It was worth the trip. All these folks we've mentioned, they were looking for the Lord. But there was one person who desperately wanted to find the Lord Jesus Christ, and he never did. Do you ever wonder about those people? A bunch of us in here, we know the Lord. And man, we remember that journey. We remember feeling after the Lord. We remember the struggle. We remember all the things. that. And uh, But boy, we, um, we found it. We found this room is full of people that would say, you know, I know the Lord. I remember seeking him. But it'll never fail that as you get talking to people along the way, you'll find somebody said, oh, yeah, you know, I I tried all that and it didn't work for me. You, you got to wonder about those folks. Um, and I think this thing about Herod, it gives us a clue about why they never found him. Look at Matthew 2 verse. Verse one again. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king. Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, 
he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor which shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. In verse 16, of course, we, we know the end of the story and we know what happened when, when they did not tell Herod where he was. Verse 16, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and then all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. You know, Herod never found the Lord. And God himself saw to that. It was God that appeared to the wise men and said, don't you go back there. You know, Herod's looking was different from all these other folks. Herod's looking and Herod wanted to find him, desperately wanted to find him. Herod's looking was not to rejoice. It was not to worship. It was not to see scripture fulfilled. He was searching for a way to get him out of the way. He was searching for a way to be done with him. Herod's searching was all about his own agenda. Herod had another loyalty. You know, he, he, it wasn't about, you know, loyalty to God and the truth. You know, that's the reason some people have a hard time finding the Lord. They, um, their, their problem is their loyalty's in the wrong place. And, and they're more loyal to a friend or to a group or to a sect or to their relatives or to a cause than they are to wanting the truth and wanting a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Herod's first loyalty was to himself and to his own kingdom. And you know, Herod did eventually meet the Lord. But when you don't meet the Lord in this life, as a, as a believer that's looking for him, you know, I mean, a person can hate the Lord, but you know how it is. Sometimes God, God grabs those people like Saul of Tarsus and man, everything changes. And, and they're, they think, man, I've been wrong all this time. And, and they turn to the Lord, but, but if you don't meet the Lord till eternity, it's a one way ticket to the fires of hell forever. And uh, that's where he, that's where he met him. You know, everybody else, the shepherds, Simeon and the wise men, they looked personally for the Lord. They they were the ones doing the looking. The shepherds didn't hire somebody. Anna and Simeon didn't have somebody posted, you know, to keep an eye out for them. They were looking themselves. But Herod looks by proxy. In other words, Herod doesn't go to Bethlehem. Herod tells the wise men, you go look. Somebody else is doing the looking for him. It's like swallowing somebody else's research. You know why a lot of people are in, in the mass, both saved and lost, they have trouble is, is um, man, they're, they're, their search is not a personal search. You know, they're, they're really relying on their guru. They're relying on their online guy. Um, they're not going to search, not themselves. They're, they're really going to trust what somebody else found. I remember being up in Uranium City a number of years ago, one summer there at camp. And uh, I was talking to one of the workers there. He was a good guy. He was uh, 35. Most of, the, most of the, the staff was in their 20s, and that's what they did. They would bring all these staff members up from a conservative Bible college in the U.S., and they bring them up. This one guy that came up every year, um, he was about 35. He'd been there from the beginning, and he was a really good guy. He was saved, and uh, he loved the Lord. He really did. But um, one day we were talking, and uh, a controversial issue came up, and uh, it was very critical. 
uh, of huge importance. You know, some people argue about stuff that's really, it doesn't matter one way or the other, but there are some issues uh, in our Christian world that really, which side of those issues you land on is massive. And um, so this would have been about 2000, 2001. He was about 35. We're, we're standing there talking. And I, I said to him, have you ever looked into this? And here's what he said. Well, you know, Brother Newman, you know, I just sort of feel like, you know, you, you can't look into everything. And so, you know what? Sometimes you just have to take the word of somebody you trust. And the whole reason we were discussing it, because he was on the wrong side of an issue that was going to mess him up for the rest of his life. That's Herod. Herod says, um, I'm sort of busy right now. I got a kingdom to run, but you go find him for me. He's not going to let you find him that way. You know, go diligently and search for the young child. Boy, the Bible is the wording of the Bible. is just incredible, isn't it? You know, search is a big word in, in our world. You know, you go to Google and you, you do the search. I was listening to a guy the other day. He said, you know, a lot of Christians, the way they do something is they'll type in a word. You know, they want to look up something. So they'll type in a word and they'll hit search. And he said, what you don't understand is even if it's a concordance online, he said, it'll bring up every time that word appears, but you'll miss key passages that relate to that where that word is not used. But since you're going to rely on the computer to do your search, you're going to miss some stuff. People miss the truth. And the Lord. And sometimes they do it because they've got their own agenda. They've got another loyalty. Their loyalty is not to the Bible first. Their loyalty is not to Jesus first. It's actually somebody else. And they would never admit that. But if you're around them long enough, it slips out. Look at Acts 17. We're almost done. They were looking If you're looking from a true heart, you're going to find him. You're going to find him. You say, what's Christmas about? I say, well, it's about a manger, and it's about shepherds, and it's about God becoming flesh, and and um, and it is. And, and, and you know, he, he was the lamb. Behold the lamb of God. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And, uh, man, he came to be the innocent substitute. He walked among men. And he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He came not to be born specifically, but he had to be born to live out a life and die and then raise from the dead. And he came as the great gift of God and he offers you eternal life. But you know what else that story is about? It's about a bunch of people that were looking and some of them have been looking for a while. But everyone that was truly looking found him, except the one who was looking but not really looking. Look at Acts 17, verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Thessalonica was a, was a neat place, and Paul did some great work there. And that's why you have two books in your Bible, First and Second Thessalonians. He writes a letter to them. But he says something about the Thessalonians as we read down further. Okay, Verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks a great multitude. And of the chief women not a few. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. Took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. And assault to the house of Jason. And sought to bring them out to the people. So what happens here is Paul winds up fleeing, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, 
who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now notice verse 11. These were more noble, the Bereans. He said they were a better sort than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Paul would stand up and preach in Berea. And, and those folks, they were they were ready to receive the word of God. I bet that was true of Thessalonica too. A bunch of the Thessalonians received the word of God. But what made the Bereans different was they were going to listen to Paul. And then they were going to open this book and search. And the Holy Ghost said that was the right thing to do. Search the scriptures. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. You know, Herod had somebody else do his searching. And God himself made sure that he would not find the Lord Jesus. But the shepherds found him. And Simeon found him. And Anna found him. And the wise men found him. And that's just a fulfillment of Jeremiah 29, where it says, Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me. I think sometimes the reason people are not finding is because because what they're looking for really isn't him. They're, they're looking for something, you know. They're, they're looking for some justification. Or they're looking for a better feeling. Or they're looking for a fix. But they're not looking for him. But he said, if you'll look for me, he said, if your heart's in it for real, he said, you'll find me. You'll find me. The Lord Jesus, here it is, 2023, and we celebrate his birth where a bunch of people found him. And he still loves to be found. And he still plants himself in places where common people can find him. And he will put a star in the sky if he needs to, to guide you to himself. And he still shows up in the church house. He loves to be found. Your Bible is probably still open to Acts chapter 17. Look at verse 27. It says that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him. The Lord says, you know, he says, I'm, I'm hoping you'll feel after me. Because he says, if you will, you'll find me. You'll find me. A number of years ago, uh, an evangelist went over to uh, to Africa, and he went over there to go on a missions trip. There were some missionaries that had invited him to come and to hold meetings over there, and he was invited into the Belgian Congo. But the main reason for the invitation was the missionaries wanted him to go with them into what was then called the Dark Forest, and it was the place where the pygmies lived. And I don't know if you know this or not. But there still are some places like that in our world that are um, unexplored. And uh, every once in a while, somebody finds a group of people there. But the reason they don't go into some of these places is because there's so much disease and death that lurks in those places. And the people that live there, you know, they have poisoned arrows. And all, you know, it's just it's just not worth the shopping tour. And so so, you know, there's a lot of places. There's still places like that in our world. He got invited over there. He said, nobody knows how many pygmies are in the dark forest. He said, first of all, they're very elusive. And, um, and it has not been very explored at all. And they call it the dark forest because some of those places are a triple canopy. Uh, I don't know if I've never been to a place like that. The average person has never been to a triple canopy forest. It's where you've got, you know, one layer of vegetation. But then over that, you have another layer that's higher. And then you have a third layer. It's even higher. So what happens is it's broad daylight, but it's not daylight in the forest. At, at high noon, it's dark in that forest because of the triple canopy. And he said, uh, we began to make our way one day after we'd been there for a while to that place. And he said, we drove our vehicle down a game trail for as many miles as we could. And at the end of the trail, the missionary had notified some natives that were there. They had about 40 natives lined up. And he said, we loaded up all our gear and we began to make our journey. He said, it was late afternoon and we ran into a broad, well-traveled trail that actually led us to the first pygmy village. And he said, it was located in a jungle clearing. It was about 50 yards wide, 
and about 150 yards long. And he said, giant trees that seemed like they reached the sky completely surrounded the village. And over two thirds of the clearing were these little tiny huts and they were covered with banana leaves. Um, he said, we walked into the clearing, not knowing what to expect. But he said, after a few minutes, we discovered that nobody was there. And, um, and he said, uh, the natives assured them, he said, guys, he said, uh, they said, you know, they probably knew you were coming when you were miles away. And so they had hightailed it out of the village and were in hiding there in the forest. He said, we set up camp in right there in their village. We just set up camp there and we sent most of our carriers away. We kept four guys. He said, those four guys were sort of right hand helpers in the, in the mission work. And he said, they all played the trumpets and sang and um, they were Africans. And he said, uh, so we, we kept them with us. And he said, just before dark, as we're sitting around the fire we built, he said, one of the natives said something in a low voice to the missionary. His name was Austin Paul and said something to him. And he said very quietly that several pygmies had come out of the jungle and were hiding behind the huts at the far end of the clearing. The missionary cautioned me, the evangelist said, not to make any sudden moves, no matter what happened. And uh, he said, we made a fire. We just acted like we didn't see a thing. And um, he said it got dark very quickly, as it always does in those tropical places. And um, after a little while, he said, knowing we were being watched, he said, I told one of the natives, he said, he said, in a low voice, quietly tell the people that are there hiding in those in those in the jungle there. Tell them that we are friends. Of course, they spoke a dialect that they thought they would know. Turns out they did. And he said, tell them that we are friends and we're about to eat. We would be honored if they would join us. So he did that. He said, after a little while, a tiny little brown man came out. He was old and wrinkled. He was wearing a monkey skin cap and a loincloth. And he walked into the light of the fire. And his name was Tarassi. And Tarassi began to speak through the interpreter. And he said, he said he was very wise and hinted that he would be a very valuable man to have as a friend. So the missionary said, well, we're, we're glad you're here. We're very happy to have the friend of one so wise and helpful. And he said, suddenly in the darkness, he said, I was startled because suddenly as my eyes adjusted, he said, I saw several pygmies. They were standing all around us with their bows and arrows and spears just a few feet away. He said, we told them through the interpreter that we had gifts for them and they silently accepted the gifts, but they showed no expression and they said nothing. And um, they disappeared as silently as they had come. He said, I must admit that I slept very uneasy that night. He said, there was only six of us. And he said, um, we had heard all about their poisoned arrows. And we never really had any strategy about what to do if we were attacked, but we had all agreed that if it was a matter of kill or be killed, because they were carrying the, the, the missionaries were carrying rifles. And that was because they were they would hunt. And that actually that turned out to be a key in this incident. But he said, but we had decided that if we were attacked and it was kill or be killed, we decided that we would be the ones that would die. He said the next morning, he said a few of those pygmies slipped back into the clearing. And they sat around the campfire while we eat breakfast. And they did not accept our invitation to eat, but they simply squatted around us and just studied our gear. They stayed around the camp all day, hardly said a word, and then they disappeared again into the jungle. He said, after several days, suddenly, in a most unexpected way, something happened that won their friendship. He said, they had come back into our clearing again, and all of a sudden, up above us, were several very large monkeys and the monkeys were chattering and screaming at everybody and just, and the natives got all excited with their bows and arrows and spears, but they realized the monkeys were too high. So the evangelist said, the missionary and I, we grabbed our rifles and we, we dropped two monkeys, boom, right there. And, and he said, and suddenly they were absolutely thrilled. They were really excited. And, um, and then we realized we were onto something. Because this was the first time in all those days they'd shown any sign of emotion or friendliness. And he said, so we told him, you come back the next day and we'll go hunting with you and we'll shoot a whole bunch of monkeys. And man, they were, 
They were on board. The next day, 18 of them showed up. And he said they began that trek through the jungle. Now, the evangelist was very tall, and he said it was very difficult to get through the jungle because it was just vines and all that stuff. But he said, uh, he said, actually, I didn't do too bad till I came to a stream that had really high banks. And um, we had to cross it on a log that had been there, you know, forever and ever. And the, the pygmies just ran across that log. But he said, I was over six foot tall and I had cowboy boots on. He said, in that stream were crocodiles. And um, he said, I was staring intently at the water below me, 14 feet below me. And uh, I was wondering how many crocodiles were below the surface. But he said, I really wasn't afraid. And I began to step across the log. And um, he said, suddenly my boots slipped. And he said, I tried to grab the vines that were nearby. And I waved my arms frantically to keep my balance. I went off backwards, fell 14 feet. And uh, I had only one thought, crocodiles. And he said, I was fully clothed, you know, had all my boots and my, my gear on. And he said, I am frantically trying to get out of that water. And he said, the pygmies, he said, it was a big drop for them because they're little short guys. And he said, he said, uh, but they instantly knew what to do. You know, they, this was their homeland. He said, one stretched out a spear and another one moved down. And then he got down and he stretched out his spear. And he said, they got it to where I could get a hold of it. And they pulled me out of the water. He said, as they did, he said, when I was safe, he said, the little hunters exploded with laughter. <laughs> he said, it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. And they rolled on the floor over and over and over again. He said, again and again that day, they would throw down their weapons and pantomime my disaster. He said, when they got back to the village, they told the story. And he said, it always gained a little something with the telling. And, um, and he said, their audience would go into peals of delighted laughter. And he said, but finally we got back with the, the monkeys and, and um, we had a feast. He said, that was a big day for us. We were in the good graces. We were all now laughing and joking around. He said, we were their friends now. But he said, but of course, that's not why we were there primarily. But we knew we had to gain some kind of a warmth before we could get an open door to share the gospel. He said, so that evening we're all gathered around the fire. And um, he said, um, we're thinking, okay, here's our chance. So they gathered everybody around, and um, the four natives began to play with their trumpets. And he said, as long as they did that, and as long as they were singing going on, he said they were just very interested. But he said, but when one of the missionaries tried to preach, he said suddenly the service became very informal. Women talked, men talked, the kids talked, the dogs fought. He said it was chaos. He said the next day and the next day and the next day we kept trying. But he said every time somebody would try to preach, he said – they figured it was time to, he said, they were just bored to tears. They're all talking, yakking, goofing off. He said, we were heart sick. He thought, here we are. We had spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to get here. And we've hit the critical moment. And he said, we absolutely cannot get their attention. Finally, the two missionaries, he said, looked at me, the evangelist, and said, why don't you try preaching to him? And he said, what good is that going to do? And they said, we don't know, but you can't do any worse than we've done. So why don't you give it a whirl? So he said, that day I went out into the jungle and he said, I walked and prayed all day. And he said, by evening light, God had answered my prayer. And I knew exactly what to do. He said, that night they were all gathered around the fire. And, and he said, I, I built the fire a little bigger than normal so there was more light. And I pulled the table up and I put, he said, I had a red Bible. I laid my red Bible on the table. And, and, um, and all of a sudden, I, through the interpreter, I said to the people, I said, where are your fathers? And one of them said, oh, my dad's right over here. And then said, oh, my, my dad's right over here. And he said, then I pointed to the very old men. I said, where are your fathers? And they said, well, they're dead. And he said, but where are they? And he said, well, we, we buried them in the jungle. He said, okay, but where are they right now? And he said, they all looked at me bewildered. And finally, one of them spoke up and said, well, Buana, that's a term of respect. It means boss. said, we bury them. And we know their spirit goes somewhere, but no man knows where. 
And the evangelist said, I know where they are. And he said, suddenly there was gasps and grunts from all over the crowd there. And finally the chief stood up and he said, you're a stranger here. How could you know where our fathers are? And he said, in the firelight, I turned and he said, I pointed very dramatically to that red book. And I said, see that red book? It can talk. He said, the sky father gave me that book and he has told me where your fathers are. He said, man, suddenly there was a murmur of excitement. And he said, and then I changed the subject. I said, so who wants to go hunting tomorrow? <laughs> and he said, a few of them said, we, 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 we want to go hunting. But he said, but nobody seemed really interested. He said they were chattering and chattering away. And, and, um, and he said, suddenly um, one of them stood up and said, Buana, does that, does that book really tell us about our fathers? And he said, I told him. He said, I assured him. I said, that book can talk. And you just told me where your fathers are. And then another man stood up and he motioned for everybody to be quiet. Silence. And he looked at the book and he went up and he listened. <laughs> and he said, uh, I don't hear that book saying anything. And the missionary said, you know, when you guys go to hunt. He said, don't you make symbols on trees that tell you where to go and how to find each other? He said, yes. He said, you know, those symbols talk. And he opened his Bible and he said, you see all these little black marks? He said, they talk and they tell me where your fathers are. And he, he said, I closed the Bible and I said, now, how many of you want to go hunting? But he said, but nobody was interested in hunting. Finally, another one of them stood up and said, if that book tells us where our fathers are, will you tell us what it says? And he said, I, I made it seem like I was really trying to think that over. And then I said to them, well, you see, God is a great God and people should be very quiet and thoughtful when someone is telling his words. I've tried to talk to you over and over again, but you won't listen. The women talk, the men talk, the children fight, the dogs. So I will, I will not tell what God's book says to people who are not quiet and thoughtful. Let, let's talk about hunting. He said, but nobody wanted to talk about hunting. Again and again, man after man stood up and asked where he had gotten the book of God and if it truly told where their fathers were. He said, every time I told him the same thing, that people should be quiet when the, when the chief speaks and when God speaks. And finally, as I knew he would, he said, the chief stood up. And he said, Buana, we will be quiet and listen if you will only tell us what God's book says. And he said, I agreed. And he said, man alive, business really picked up right there. He said, the men went to their wives, shook their fists in their faces. He says, they demanded that they would shut up. He said, the boys got smacked and the girls. He said, they ran the dogs out of the camp. He said, I've never had a more attentive audience in my whole life. And he said, I knew they'd never heard of Christ or heaven or hell or salvation. So I began with Adam and Eve and creation. And he said, I went through it a little bit and it was getting late and I stopped. And he said, pygmy after pygmy said, would you please tell us more? Would you please tell us more? And he said, I'll tell you more in the morning. And he said, far into the night, you could hear them talking. And he said, we went to bed. And he said, I woke up and rolled over. And he said, by the time I got into a sitting position, he said, I almost jumped out of my skin. He said, the entire village was sitting on the ground in front of our shelters. And they were as quiet as little mouse. And the chief stood up and said, it is the following day. Now tell us what God's book says. And he said, again, I read and spoke. And he said, I took them all the way through. And I told them about sin and death and Adam and Eve and the birth of Christ and how Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. And, and he said, in the course of the messages, the people learned where their fathers were. He said, one night I was talking and suddenly that first native, you know, the first one that had stepped into clearing when they first made contact, his name was Tarassi. He says, Tarassi, 
stood up and he said, Buana? He said, I thought it must be something like this. Now we're talking about looking for Jesus. You ready? He said, many times I have climbed the highest tree and looked into the sky trying to see God. I felt surely he must be up there somewhere. And again and again from the top of the tree, I've cried out to God. God, are you there? Can you hear me? He said, can you see Tarasi? God, I'm afraid. Come and help me. But he said, but I never heard a word. He said, I thought God surely must have some way of helping poor old Tarasi. He said, I'm so glad to hear of Jesus and to know he died for me. I thought it must be something like that. Tarasi turned to Jesus Christ, his son to turn to Jesus Christ. Two years later, there was a church, one of the only churches in the world in a pygmy village. And you know what God did? Tarasi had climbed that tree looking for God. You know what God did? God said, let me help you find him. And he sent somebody to the darkest place on earth so that they could find him. Are you looking for Jesus this morning? If, you, if you're not saved... All I got to say is when the day comes to where you really want to find him, oh, my soul, you will find him. And if you're saved this morning and you love the Lord and you find yourself in the darkness like Job did, Job lost everything. You know, he went through that horrible time. And in about chapter 29 of Job, Job says, oh, that I knew where I might find him. And Job says, I know God's there. He says, but I can't find him. And yet God was there. God was right there. God was recording every word. And you guys know the story. You hit about chapter 38 or 39, and it says, and God appeared in the whirlwind, and God spoke. You know what happened? There was a delay. But Job wanted to find the Lord, and he found him again. You know, it's the birth of Christ. We're going to go home. And uh, I, don't, I don't know, honestly, if you'll give the Lord's birth another thought today. But if you do, if you do, remember, it's all about people that wanted to find the Lord. And the Lord made it to where anybody could find him. Let's pray. Lord, bless your truth, I pray. Lord, the folks that need to find you this morning, help, help them to know that if they will seek you, they will find you. And Lord, it will be one of the greatest days of their life. Lord, may they remember all the people that found you. May they remember the one guy that didn't find you. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed as the piano plays, if God has spoken to you, why don't you talk to him this morning?
Lord, thank you for this day. God bless. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son. And God guide us, Lord. Watch over us. I pray that you give everybody a blessed holiday, Lord. And help those that are seeking you, Lord, to find you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. God bless you. And have a great Christmas.